Colossians. It's our continuing uh, um, series, and I love it. I, I'm challenged to, um, to just learn more. I've been reading this book for 20 plus years, and to be honest, it is, again, one of those uh, times when God just speaks to me uh, and teaches me new things that I didn't even see before in this passage. For example, when I, if you had, had you asked me like a month ago, what is the main issue of Colossians 2? I've said, of course, Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Those are the main points, you know. Christ has nailed on the cross the, um, the law that stood against us. But there's so much more in that, in this chapter. And especially, uh, we have this rich Christology, the teaching about Christ in this passage, but it all comes in a context. And the context is warnings. Paul gives the church here a bunch of warnings concerning dangers that were real and present in their lives. But why do we need warnings? Why do we need to mind the gap, as they say in, in London, I believe? It's because we are fallible people. It's not because liability only. I mean, we have most of science are because of liability, you know, don't swallow detergent. That's a liability issue, I guess. But uh, most of them are because we are prone to, to danger. We are prone to, to just take unnecessary risks. And Paul knows that. He knows the risk of spiritual stumbling, of our spiritual losing our path. Our human nature is, is such that we tend to choose the things that we can control. And Paul gives warnings here about this, we'll see in a, in a moment, this man-made rules, regulations, and religions that are so much easier for us to control because we call the shots, not God. And we, we create stuff that is for our own benefit through our own eyes, but is so detrimental to, for life in Christ, life in faith. And Paul gives, like I said, a bunch of warnings, but it starts with the commendation or ex ex exhortation. And we'll start with this right now. So what is the exhortation? If your Bible's open, please read with me from Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. I'm reading from ESV translation, if that makes any difference. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. I want you to notice here something that Paul actually brings up in the book of Gal Gal Galatians as well. Sorry about that. It is how, the way you received Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ, before we move on, what does he mean by that? As you received Christ, what is the meaning of those words? And I have just one brief answer, which is very, actually very rich. Grace and faith. You have received Christ by grace. You did not earn or deserved your place in Christ. So it's by grace and also by faith. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, you have received Christ by faith, by grace. What is the opposite of this? Well, if you remember the book of Colossians, the opposite is by works. People thought they could merit or work their way into God's graces, but Paul says that is futile. And if that's, if that is actually against the gospel. So Paul reminds them, as you have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And this is a beautiful image of walking in Christ. It is not new for Paul. It's not uh, just for Paul alone. Jo uh, John uses the same uh, phrases a couple of times, to walk in or walk with Christ. It is basically meaning to imitate or to have a life that reflects Christ. To be visibly uh, visible for others that you are a Christian. That you walk as the Lord walked. That's uh, 1 John verse, chapter 2, verse 6. If you talk, I had the t-shirt that said, this is what to paraphrase. If you talk the talk, then you should walk the walk. Okay, that's, that's my t-shirt. The actual uh, uh, verse says, if you say you are in Christ, you should live a life that reflects Christ. And even more than he uh, describes, how does this life in Christ look like? So Paul is telling them, is exhorting them, Please live a life in the Lord, walking in the Lord. And how is that? Well, it is rooted up and built up in him. Rooted and built up in him. And these images are, if you, if you can look at those words, rooted. What does that bring to you in your mind as an image? Rooted in Christ. 
You mentioned of a tree, for example, Psalms 1, you know, of a tree planted near waters, good waters, something with deep roots that is solid and winds that don't, don't move them, I mean, don't bring them down. Rooted means we have the, source, the resources to live a life. You have all the energy from Christ. You're rooted and you're not able to be moved by every wind and everything that comes against you. And again, built up has the same image as Matthew 7 towards the end of a house put on a foundation. Built up on a solid foundation, rooted and built up and even more established in faith. Established in faith. Having a faith that is the, if you want, what keeps things together in your life. Your faith in Christ. And Paul says, you've been taught this just as you, have, you were taught and abound in thanksgiving. Bring everything back together in thanksgiving. Establishing faith means I, I cannot even, uh, I cannot think of, I, I cannot but think of Psalm 15, an unshakable life. Those who live this life cannot, will not be shaken. That's the end of Psalms 15. Thankful in abundance because you know who you are in Christ. You know your foundation, your roots, your faith, and therefore you know your blessings and you're thankful for that. Thankful in abundance because you know Christ. And what is the idea here? If you can summarize it, is be established in the truth. Be established in Christ. That's the call that Paul has for, for Colossians and for us also. And if you want, there's a beautiful image of a mature Christian's, Christian we should all aspire to. Walking in Christ, rooted and built up, established in faith and thankful. If you ever thought, or if you ever saw the image of a great mature Christian, that's right there in just a few words. And we'll be contrasted soon with the image of a troublemaker, but that's a few verses later. But just Paul wants to give them first how it's like a mirror. You should look like this. But then he knows their troubles and dangers. He knows that he needs to give them some warnings just because we as humans, from Adam on, we try to find good outside God. You know, if you remember our teachings in Genesis about five years ago, huh? I don't. Anyway, we went through Genesis uh, 1, 2, and 3, and we discussed that idea that the devil's lie was that God is hiding something good. And the men, you know, Adam and Eve, they can find good beyond what God has given them. Uh, what exactly here is the warnings of Paul are concerning that those kinds of religions or religious activities that are trying to find good beyond God, beyond what God has given them. And the first warning is this. It's very stern. Make sure no one takes you captive. Let's read verse 8. It's on the screen. See to it that no one takes you captive. How? By philosophy and empty deceit. According to human traditions. According to the elemental spirits of the world. And not according to Christ. This is the first warning, and in a way, it kind of reminds us of uh, one previous warning in verse, I think, 4, when it said there, may sure, make sure that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. We touched this uh, a bit on this last, uh, last Sunday. This verse continues the same idea, that there is a risk of looking for easy answers in philosophies and traditions and man-made man -made tradition. It's there. And this is not a... blank statement against all philosophies. Paul is not attacking all the Greek philosophers and says they're all garbage. No, what he says is around the church, in the church, within the culture that influences the church, there are some philosophies that tell you they can offer you a better deal than God. Easier, faster, you, you name it, you call it, you know. But these are human traditions and philosophies and Paul calls them empty deceit. He calls them according to the elemental spirits of this world. And I looked up these words uh, because it's just, I mean, it's we're un, how say, unusual for me, elemental spirits. And I realized in, uh, that in, for the Greeks, this, this meant two things, either the fundamental principles of pagan religions, fundamental principles of pagan religions, or, which I believe is actually the case here, demonic activity, demonic spirits. And that's not just for those worlds, for those times. You know, this danger of philosophies and uh, human traditions and all these elemental spirits at work is, is for us today. 
I mean, some of the, some of, what are some of the traps of, let's say, modern day philosophies and human traditions? I'm just going to mention a few, and these are old. I mean, old as in like five, ten years ago. I haven't taken anything current for like this year. But like, for example, the idea that there is no hell. God is such a God of love that he cannot punish anyone. Hell is just a lie. Or hell is like today because, you know, have to endure, um, you know, whatever. No cop 668. Or I'm just, that was a joke, joke. So there is no hell. Or there are many ways to God. Yeah, I mean, there's one good way, which is Christ, but that's not the only way, you know? There's actually a Christian who was famous about 10, 15 years ago who said Christ is the best way to God. And we all know that's a lie. But it is a philosophy that goes out there and gives some hope to people that are trying to find their way to some spiritual solace, but not through Christ, not through God, because they do not want to submit to God's call of, of, of holiness and repentance. Or, God loves sinners as they are, no change necessary. God just loves you as you are, you know, just don't worry about being changed or transformed or changing your behavior, words, uh, the way you speak. No, don't worry, God loves you, don't change, you know. And we all see the trap here, the fact that people become captive to this attempt to find uh, some sort of a peace, spiritual peace, but with no God included. And Paul says, these are not according to Christ. And then he gives us the truth. It says what? For in him, I should probably click. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He said, those lies are empty deceit. That was verse 8, empty Deceit. Now he says, the fullness is in Christ. And you have been all, you have all been filled with him. You, that's emptiness. Don't look there. Don't get yourself captive. That's just empty stuff. Christ is the fullness, and you have been filled in him, in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also we are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So what's, it's a bunch of stuff here. Let's just break it down a bit. You have been filled with him as he is fully God. Do not go looking for empty, deceitful stuff beyond Christ or without Christ, things that may give you like, okay, these are the three steps to happiness. Don't worry about Christ. Just take these three steps or 12 steps, whatever, because the true fullness can only be found in Christ. And then Paul brings here circumcision and baptisms at, as, two si baptism, as two symbols of covenant and fellowship. We don't have to have a circumcision of the body, of the flesh as the old covenant had, we have this circumcision of the heart, as Paul calls it a few times, which means you have been marked as being one of God's people. And more, you have been brought up in baptism. You died to the old past and you have been brought up through baptism through a full fellowship with God. You're in covenant, you're in fellowship with Christ. And why do you look for power in elemental spirits? You know, do you think demons and whatever can bring you more power? Just listen to these words. You have been raised with him in the powerful working of God. You got all the power you need. I was chatting last night with, uh, with a friend and we we're just, uh, just discussing Romans 8. And I just couldn't think, could not help but think about the verse that the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives or dwells in you. Why do we look for power outside Christ when he's got the fullness and all the power that no one else can actually give? They will tell you, they will lie, saying, we've got the power. And I can actually sing that sometimes. But it's, it's not, it's just a lie. And Paul knows that and he gives this, this statement or this warning, watch your step. Don't let yourself be taken captive or prisoner. As you have received Christ by grace, by faith, so walk in him. That's the first warning. The second one is interesting. Let no one judge you. I mean, that's kind of hard to, to do. I mean, I mean, if Steve wants to judge me today, he can. I mean, 
I cannot stop him from judging me, but what I can is what I can do is to not let that affect me or change my behavior, to please Steve so that he won't he will stop judging me. I modify my choices and behavior so I can, you know, someone, sorry, Steve, this is just an example. I, you know, <laughs> you know, we cannot stop people from judging us. And the danger is not that they judge us. We will be judged. People will look at us and say, ha, 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 you know. But what we can and should do is to not let that change our choices. Do not let that, those lies deceive us, as it says here. And I want to just focus um, on this uh, thing. So being judged here relates to food, drink, and uh, I, I put this vacation days. Uh, it's holidays, what you call those, um, holy days. And um, verse 16 has the warning, is the one with yellow on the screen. And the rest is basically Paul's explanation of why should you not listen to those lies. Let's read 13 through 17. And you who were dead in your trespasses and in uncircumcision of the flesh, God made alive together with him. God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all trespasses by the canceling of the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you, questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival of new moon or Sabbath. These are but the shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. What do we have here? A different type of philosophy that wants to take people captive by bringing them back to the law. What you eat, what you drink, the festivals you keep, the Sabbaths you keep, you know, keeping up the law, seeing that if I do these steps, I can be good with God. I don't have to change my heart. If I do these steps, I'm good with God. I come back from a background of, of um, Christianity in, uh, in Eastern, Eastern Europe, where the presence in the church was all you need to do. Do the sign of the cross a few times, you know, bow down to the priest and kneel and, and have them pray over you and just be there during the liturgy. And that was enough. No change of heart asked of you. No change of behavior. You know, do these steps and you're good. People did not look at hearts. And just, you know, just a, it's a Pharisee attitude. Go back to the, uh, the Jews that Christ was, was struggling with. When they're trying just to have that veneer of spirituality by doing stuff, but having no heart changed. Whitewashed walls with death inside is what Christ called them. So verse 16, I said, was the warning. No one judge you or don't let yourself be judged or don't let your life be changed because somebody chooses to ju judge you about food, drinks, festival, celebration, which is obviously a, um, just a, an image of, of the law. And Paul says, these are the shadow. These have no substance. Why are you afraid? It's just a shadow. It's man-made rules. It's man-made religion. Verses, like I said, 13 and 15, to 15 gives you the truth. All those things that stood against you have been nailed at the cross. You were a man, an enemy of God, dead in your trespasses and in your uncircumcision, but God made you alive. God forgave you. God canceled all the things that stood against you. Even more, not just canceled, he nailed them on the cross. And all those powers that would like to come against you have been put out, to, put to open shame so, through the triumph of Christ over them. So why go back to legalism? Why try to follow up man-made religions when you have everything you need in Christ? And those are just shadow. And I wish this was just contained to the first and second centuries, but they're not. Even today, we have judgments in the church, whether it's the external formal forms of worship, what we sing, how we sing, how we dress, how we, I mean, you know, go further than that. It's the culture clashes when you have different cultures coming together and people just don't make sense of why do they do this? Why do they do that, you know? Remember the uh, um, Americans who come to our, came to our church in Romania and they were just so surprised. And we serve communion with actual wine. And they're like, why do you do this? It's like, I don't know. 
we've always done it. It's wine, just in John 2. It's like, what's wrong with that? Oh, blah, blah. anyway. So I'm not saying it's wrong to have communion with Jews. Don't get me wrong. But the problem is that we sometimes get to the point where we judge, believing that if people don't do what we think is good, they must be wrong. My dad was an expert in assuming or assessing everything through his own uh, image. If, th if things were not like what he would like, they were wrong. If people would say something that he disagreed with, they were wrong. If people said something else that he, I mean, everything that was not his opinion, position, or likeness was bad and wrong. And I grew up with thinking this way, if I come to a different conclusion, I must be wrong. I was in school, and if I worked on a math exercise and I, get, I got to a different result than my, my neighbor, I thought always, oh, I must be wrong. It haunted me a long time. Even today, sometimes those, comes to my, those things come to mind because I was judged and I allowed myself to be judged. And Paul comes and says, don't. Do not fall to that trap, of letting the judgment of others change your choices, behavior, thoughts, and so, forth, and so, forth, so on and so forth. You know the truth. You're free in Christ. The powers that were against you, the law that stood against you has been nailed. And funny thing is, I'm not funny, but interesting thing is that the word in Colossians 2, 14, 15 about the, right, the writing that stood against us. What, let, me, let me actually give you the right verse. The record, verse 14, the, uh, the record of debt. In Greek, actually, the word of a handwriting. The handwriting that was against you was nailed at the cross. Whose handwriting? Even God himself. Because he gave the law to Moses with his own finger writing on the, on the, on the stones. Even, even what I, I gave you back through Moses, it's now on the cross because it has been used to just enchain you. And Paul says, be free. Do not let yourself be judged by this. There are judgments against us from the outside, from the, the new religion of tolerance, where you know, everything is accepted, just being Christ, being Christian is not accepted. And we know we might suffer consequences if we don't. And people expect us to change or, you know, change or get canceled. That's the new words today. And some people, what's the word, fold because they don't want to be canceled. And some people simply don't care. If that's your opinion, whatever. You know, I love... This is not a Christian response, but um, somebody tried to cancel the author of um, the thing with the wizards. What's it called? Harry Potter. Thank you. Somebody tried to cancel the author of Harry Potter and asked her, how do you sleep at night? When you, on your, and it was a thing with the new transgender philosophy and stuff. And she said, as I roll in my wads of cash, I sleep really well. So she just, just brushed them off, you know? And although I don't agree with, with a lot of things, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of, of this person necessarily, I just love the idea of not allowing yourself to be canceled by somebody's judgment. And that's exactly what Paul says here. Don't let people cancel you or judge you, and that would change your choices, behavior, or who you are. You're something special in Christ. Alive, freed, under no condemnation, fool with God's power. Don't let people cancel or judge you. You know, I'm trying to use those words in, in a way that can make sense today. Or if I, if I can watch, sorry, I uh, can say just like Paul said before, as you have received Christ by grace and by faith, so walk in him. Do not let people, do not let people's judgment affect or change who you are in Christ. And Paul continues. I mean, it's, a, it's one of those passages where stern warning after stern warning come in. The third one is, is interesting. Do not, yourself, do not let yourself be disqualified. Don't get disqualified. Don't lose your prize. Don't let anyone steal your prize. What is the image here? Of course, it's just the image of a, of a race. It's not new to Paul, you know, the image of a Christian running in a race. And Paul says, people may try to disqualify you. That's why I said, we'll find the definition of a re religious troublemaker. Let's read verses um, 18 and 19. 
Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in details about visions, <laughs> up without reason, she is puffed up without reason, by his sensuous, sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Paul says there are people around, even around the church, maybe even within the church, so just like this, they insist on, on asceticism, which is what? If you don't know what the word means, uh, a harshness to the body of Christ, sorry, a harsh, harshness to your own body that attempts to earn God's favor just by being harsh to your body. I mean, don't get me wrong, it is good to be disciplined to your body. Paul says he fights against his flesh, against his body. It is good to fast. It is good to just have measures. But if you think you can earn God's favor by being uh, an, an ascetic person, you know, it's, it don't work. It don't work that way. God has already pledged his love towards you. You don't have to earn it. Do you have to be disciplined? Yeah. But you won't get more favor by being, dis or being uh, you know, ascetic uh, as Paul says here, even more, it says, a proud and sensuous mind, a proud and sensuous mind, a mind that's only focused on feelings and I'll say desires of the flesh and is full of pride. Have you witnessed such people who think they're so good in themselves compared to the others? They actually coined the phrase in English. We don't have it in Romanian, but it's in English. Better than thou. Am I saying it right? You know, that's where it comes from. When people who thought that in their pride, they're better than you are. People that, that thought that, you know, I do more for Christ than you do. Therefore, I am good. I'm better. God loves me more. And the Gnostics, going back to what we are dealing with in Colossians, the Gnostics were experts at saying, ha ha, God loves me because I know more than you do. You know, that was the whole attitude of pride, but it didn't lead to a holy life. It just led to a life led by the flesh and its desires. Even more, fake relig religiosity, fake worship, fake visions. Maybe not fake, maybe we're just visions, but not from the right source. It says here, the worship, sorry, I'm going back to, <clears throat> to the text. It says in worship of, uh, worship of angels, which is again, fake worship. I mean, we may worship them, but it's not the right type of worship. It's not one that brings you anything good. On the contrary, that's why I call it fake worship. And also it says, uh, going on detail about visions, thinking that, oh, if I had this vision, that makes me good. Remember back in the Open Heaven Church, back in Romania, at one time we had this open mic for, for testimonies. And it was a great time. People would come up and, say, and share, you know, God did this for me this week. God taught me this, this week. God humbled me with this this week. Until one day one guy comes up and starts sharing about a dove that came out of his mouth and spoke. And it's like, oh my goodness. It's like, I didn't know how to stop him fast, fast enough. I and mean, that was the last day we had open mic in the church, you know. Uh, because people get so puffed up and they have this idea that, oh, I had this vision. You know what about the visions? They cannot be checked or controlled. And you have to trust the person, that the person is actually a humble, God-seeking person, that you may trust the source. If, it's, if you know it's a, ah, never, don't want to go there. Fake worship, fake visions, fake religiosity. Different religious or spiritual attempts to fill an actual void. People do try to fill a void. Don't get me wrong. People are seeking for something. They want full fullness. They want fulfillment. Want, they want peace. What they don't want is to be obedient to God. That's a problem. People are trying to find shortcuts to be, to be good with God, but not through his ordained path of repentance and faith and growth in discipleship. The danger? Losing your prize. And how? By not holding fast to the head. Keeping the law or laws and forsaking the gospel, you know, looking at the shadows of things to come, you know, like I said, asceticism, worship of angels, visions, and pride. What is the truth? To glean it from this play, from this passage, the truth is this: you got to hold fast to the head, which is Christ. You got to hold fast to the head because from the head you get nourishment and you get knit together in love. 
to its joints and ligaments, and you grow with a growth that is from God. You think that worshiping angels will give you growth or give you like a higher level of spirituality? No. The only growth that matters comes as you are holding fast to the head and you grow through what Christ gives you. And Paul continues with one last warning. And I, I could just imagine, you know, I, if I, I was reading this passage this week and just kept making notes and highlights and stuff, it's like I, I had this image in mind, Paul saying, oh, why? You know, just like exasperation, why? He says these words here, let me, why do you submit to regulations that have no value? That is the, the, the short version of these verses. Why do you submit to stuff that has no value? What has no value? Let's read 20 to, 30, 20 to 23rd. Since, or if, you, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations like don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, referring to things that all have all perish as they are, as they are used, according to the human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What happened? People believed basically that if they go by these rules, do not handle, do not touch, do not taste, which mostly refers to foods, foods and drinks, I would say probably. They thought if we, if we abstain from these things, no bacon for a month, they would somehow earn God's favor. Somehow they'll promote themselves as being religious and whatever. And Paul says they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. I read, you know, I used to uh, study history back in the day. Actually, I was uh, doing translation for a professor for a class every year for like seven or eight years. So I actually almost memorized the class. I remember one short lesson from um, the age, the, uh, how say, the last part of the age of the monks of the desert, where this guy had some real issues with, uh, with temptations, you know, desiring women. You know, he was tempted by, by stuff. So he made a radical choice. He made himself a eunuch. How to say this nicely? He made himself a eunuch. If you don't know what that means, ask me at the end. And then he moved to the desert. So he removed things from his body, and then he removed himself from the society. And he writes in a book later on that as he moved in the desert, in a cave, his temptations came with him. Nothing had changed. I mean, something did change physically, but... You know, that was a man-made uh, mistake. But nothing has changed in his spirituality. He realized all he did, the removal of, of organ, organs and the removal from himself from society, helped nothing with the indulgence of the flesh. He still wanted or craved the same stuff. He didn't try repentance. I mean, I, I'm not going back there. Anyway, that's just different stuff back, back in the day. That's, that's like sixth century, if I remember correctly. Attempts of humans to win God's pleasure, pleasure, pleasure by human precepts and teachings that have indeed an appearance of wisdom. And that attracts us. You get a book, you know, fast 45 days, more than Christ, five days more than Christ, and you'll be good. God will love you. I'm not saying fasting is bad. Don't get me wrong. I fast. Even in the present days, I fast. But people sometimes believe that they can earn a lot more by that than just the simple fact they remember that they are in Christ and they have all the love that they need. They have been filled in Christ already. And it says here, an appearance of wisdom, because it's attractive, <clears throat> but it's a self-made religion. And again, asceticism or severity to the body of no value. The rules have to do with matters of this world. The rules reflect human and not divine teaching, and the rules cannot bring spiritual transformation, wrote a guy named Douglas J. Moo. All these rules that we think can make us good have no value. The truth is that God is the only power that works in us through His Spirit to bring us to obedience and fullness in Christ. And all we need to go, all we need to do is just come before God 
like in, now we just read that in Hebrews 4, come before God with boldness, with humility, and ask him to help us. And he said he will help us to walk in obedience and in the same liberty that Christ has won for us at the cross. As you have received Christ by grace and by faith, so walk in him. That is the main point, verses two and six, first, chapter two, verses two and six. And the call is walk in Christ and watch your step. I read this, uh, this um, quote from, it's actually on the screen. Oh, can you see that? Alistair Wilson wrote these words. Human beings are often attracted to dra dramatic acts of self-denial. We enjoy that, you know, because it says we are so much better, you know. In their search for peace and for God. However, the message of the gospel refutes all such attempts to make a grand stand or grand gesture for God. God has already accomplished all that is required in Christ. And so there is no further there is nothing further they can, that can be done. Even those of us who have believed the gospel can be led to believe that externals are what matters most to God. Say it again. Even those of us that believed the gospel can be led to believe that externals are what matters most to God. If that begins to happen, we must be confronted with reality just as Paul confronted the Colossians. And the best way for that is for that to happen is to just do what Paul did, present the true gospel again in its simplicity and completeness. I love this, this, uh, this quote. So going back to what we just read, the warnings, as you walk, watch your step. As you walk in him, watch your step because there are dangers even for the redeemed. Do not let yourself influenced by the philosophies of the world. Do not yourself be, be fooled, enslaved by the philosophies of this world. You have all the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in Christ. That's Colossians 1 verse 9. You got all the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding in Christ. Do not yourself be judged, or put it, I said before, do not let judgments make you alter your great grace-filled course of faith. Do not let judgments make you alter your grace-filled course. Or like I said before, don't get yourself canceled. Don't let people cancel you. Just show them you care more about what Christ says than what they say, whoever they are. Then again, do not get disqualified by losing your target or your grasp on what matters most. Do not get yourself disqualified by assuming you can earn your prize by going that route, not through Christ. And last one, do not succumb to the temptation to earn grace by submitting to regulations which have no actual value in your fight against your own flesh. But in the end, whoops. In the end, do not walk in fear of those traps. I, I thought more a lot about this, uh, to how to end this. And my point is, is, don't be afraid of what the devil tries to bring in your path and say, oh, what if I need, I need more warnings, you know, more signs, you know, more labels. All we need to know is Christ. I don't need to know every kind of bad omelet so I can discern what a good omelet looks like or tastes like. If I know the good omelet, then every bad omelet, it's so obvious to me. I don't have to learn all of them. Sorry, I'm hungry. The same with, with Christ. I don't need to know every lie to know that, that it's a lie. All I need to know is Christ and know him fully, know his word, be immersed in his word and every lie that comes across. I can tell something is off because I have the truth to compare it with. So don't walk in fear, guys, of all those traps, but be aware that there are traps. Walk in Christ and watch your step. Walk in the light, and you will discern all these attempts of the devil to rob us. So Paul's concern is that we might fall into a man-made religiosity or religion. And he knows that is so damaging to our faith and to our walk with, with Jesus. You know, whether it's a desire to feel superior, to show that you have this false zeal, or zeal, but which actually is false, or to have this exaggerated, exaggerated spirituality, the results are equally damaging to our health spiritually speaking. So the call is the same. Remain focused on Christ. Remain centered on Christ, not on religious stuff. 
All these warnings are meant to awaken us to the threats that might be out there, not might, sorry, they are out there, and remind us that all we need to do is to know Christ, know Him fully, and knowing Christ is possible. I said this a few weeks ago. He's everything to us. He gave us all that we need. He took away all the commandments that stood against us and gave us freedom and life. So this is actually not that complicated. Walk in Christ as you have received him and watch your step. Amen. Let's pray.